All right, guys. To start out with media law this week, the first thing I want to talk about is the First Amendment. Uh, as a media professional of any sort, you should know what the First Amendment is. But especially if you're going to be going into any type of journalism, whether print or broadcast or um, blogging or anything, it's important to know where the First Amendment came from and why you as a journalist should know it. Um, so I like this meme. It says, you keep saying the First Amendment. I do not think it means what you think it means. Uh, this is a quote from the Princess Bride that's been adapted, of course. But uh, a lot of people, you know, will say, oh, they're taking away our First Amendment right, or I have the right to the First Amendment, but they don't really know what it means. So <clears throat> what I want you to think about is think about you as an individual are just talking to your friends or your family about what's going on in the world today. And you could talk about, um, you know, how you think, you know, them taking away TikTok is not right or um, how you don't like our current administration, um, how you're angry about, you know, new tax laws, all these different things. But instead of being able to say those things or read about them, you are tried and put in jail for it. And that's really what happened with the colonies. And that's why when we became our own independent country from England, we decided that the first law that would establish our country would be that we'd have the freedom to say and discuss and criticize those in charge. So when you think about the First Amendment, keep that in mind. Now, this is what the First Amendment says. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Um, I highly encourage you to memorize this not because you can say oh I, I you know the first amendment you know um but because if somebody says oh well you know you say that you have the right to the first amendment do you even know it you can actually say it instead of just being like yeah it's a uh, free speech and maybe religion i think so um and if you're not good at memorizing you can always just say it's a freedom of speech freedom of religion freedom of the press freedom of petition and the freedom of assembly so all of those are different things, but most of the time it comes down to free speech. Now, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about where the idea came from, but when we talk about why the First Amendment was established, um, there's a few things that were going on. So um, press freedom and just the freedom of citizens in the colonies um, was being looked at um, in a way that, you know, they knew we were criticizing the British monarchy and the government, and they didn't like that. And there was this shift um, in Parliament at the time, and basically people um, decided, well, we don't want them saying anything bad against us. We don't want them to get this idea that they don't have to follow our rule, um, even if they are across the ocean. And so um, they started really hammering down on what was considered um, free speech and what wasn't. Um, they also started taking away freedom of the press. A lot of people had to um, get licenses to be a printer. And we talked about that with the newspaper. Um, and if you printed something they didn't like, they would throw you in jail, sometimes tar and feather you or even kill you. Now, this is where we get sedacious libel. And that is illegal to publish anything harmful to the reputation of the colonial governor. Basically, if you say anything that he doesn't like, um, he can have you um, punished. We also got what was called the Alien and Sedations Act during this time. And basically what it was was prosecutions and convictions under this act really targeted outspoken publishers and political opponents. Um, 
Basically, if you said anything false, scandalous, or malicious about the government, or you wrote anything that was malicious against the government, you were considered um, doing a sedacious act. Now, um, this really targeted outspoken publishers and pol political opponent opponents, um, and people really just didn't know what freedoms they had and they were very scared now you've had people like the founding fathers who didn't care Benjamin Franklin is one of them we talked about who just went on with saying what he wanted um we talked about the Zinger trial and all these different things that really set this president so as the colonies grew more independent the more they decided they didn't want to be ruled under this idea that you could not say anything against those who were ruling <laughs> Now, <clears throat> when we talk about, you know, the freedom of the press and how it came about, we also have to talk about um, the fact that democracy itself requires a free press. So if you believe that your country is a democracy, which the U.S. does, um, it means that you have to require free press. And when we talk about the First Amendment, it applies to every citizen, but in retrospect, it was made for printers and the press specifically to be able to print things against those in rule um, and become what we know now as the fourth estate or the watchdog. Um, so if you remember back in high school government, we have three checks and balances um, that, you know, look after each other in the government. And the press is considered the fourth one to check all of them. So uh, therefore, democracy requires free press. And um, if you have a free press, you are also following what is called libertarianism. This is based on John Milton's self-writing principle. And we'll talk a little bit about this in ethics next week. But the idea is that there's a free flow of ideas and information, um, and that allows the truth to emerge. Basically, if people are able to come together and discuss things, um, people are rationally good. Um, they want to know the truth. They want to do what's good for society. And so the truth will eventually come out. And if there's free and full access to information, people will be able to tell what is right and wrong. And so um, if that is established through a democracy, censorship is not necessary. Um, and so that is where we get the idea that we should have the right to free press. Now, when it comes to the clarity of how the First Amendment is um, taken in court there's a few things uh so one the supreme court has struggled to decide whether um and how the first amendment protects new media um and so they try to generally treat each media medium differently um depending on what it is and how they apply the first amendment to it um the framers of the constitution um perceived that the First Amendment was um, a guide in application and could be interpreted on different things. We also have what's called ad hoc balancing, but which basically says that the court that is deciding whether um, the First Amendment can be used in the law in a courtroom um, means that they can weigh specific facts on each side and then decide what merits the most um, to determine the case. Um, it also means that they can go back and look at other cases that are similar and decide, does this apply to this case now? We also have um, <clears throat> the idea that the First Amendment is um, a way to provide social functions, advancement in certain fundamental values, and increase the ability of minorities, meaning that you have the right to speak up. And of course, um, lastly, we have speech deserves protection. And that basically just means that as Americans, we have the right to free speech and that helps us in the aid for the search for the truth. It, it helps advance our self-governance and it provides a check on the government's abuse of power. And that's kind of what we talked about previously. 
Um, like I said, the First Amendment was designed for the press specifically. Um, and because of that, uh, you have to think about, you know, what does that mean? Um, what is the press? Well, the press, of course, is news, but it also is film. It can be advertising content. It can be entertainment. Um, and so the Supreme Court consistently um, is expanding and changing the idea of what free press is and how it's protected. When it comes to um, what is protected by free speech and what isn't, one of the things that we have to look at is prior restraint. Um, and some of those things are topics like threats to national security, um, discussing an ongoing trial, the use of copyrighted materials and laws that criminalize, criminalize obscenity. Um, so basically, if things are obscene, they are copyrighted or trademarked, or they're a threat to national security, um, the media can basically be told, no, you don't have the right to free speech. And this is where the whole TikTok debacle comes in, because they believe that it's a threat to national security. Um, I don't know how they differentiate that from any other social media platform, but that is what's going on in um, Congress right now. So when you talk about freedom of speech, there are a few things, like I said, that just mean, no, it doesn't apply to you. And national security is one of those. Um, <clears throat> We also have what's called um, content neutral laws. And um, basically these are laws that impose speech restrictions um, to advance legitimate governmental interests uh, without targeting particular viewpoints. Um, the courts basically find these a neutral idea. Um, and how you decide if there is, if the content is neutral, um, if it is unrelated to the su suppression of speech, if it advances an important government interest, or if it is narrowly tailored to achieve the interest while only incidentally restricting protected speech. Uh, to test this, there's a three-part test called the O'Brien test, um, and basically it just decides if there should be a regulation of speech, um, and this is where we get the idea of symbolic expression. So you can like burn a flag or um, burn your draft card in different situations. Um, and so the O'Brien test was the law that they determined from a court case on whether um, doing certain things was protected by free speech. Along with content neutral laws, we also have what is content based laws. Um, and basically, this just means that the government um, can be stopped from infringing or um, having disfavored ideas. Uh, basically, the Supreme Court applies this in the most rigorous test to determine whether content based laws are constitutional. Um, basically, uh, Congress wants to have strict scrutiny um, and uh, be able to apply different treatment to different types of speech and under different uses, um, meaning that they try to not have very many restrictions and um, they want to make sure that it advances and is compelling to a government interest if they do have to do something. Um, and when it, you say compelling interest, it means a government interest of the highest order and interest the government is required to protect. Again, this is where we get the idea of TikTok being banned. Then we have uh, the protection of political speech. Um, this uh, has come in a lot in the last couple of years about what is protected and what isn't when it comes to political speech and protests. Um, basically, political speech deserves one of the highest level of constitutional protection, um, and it is basically at the core of what the First Amendment is designed to protect. Um, 
And so, you know, you have certain things that have been put in place to kind of help people talk about politics, but also to protect other people from being swayed by politics. So like, that's why you can't wear certain, um, you know, things to like a polling place um, or uh, you can't take down um, or you can't like put up uh, hate speech, things like that. Um, it also protects like the idea of opinion pieces and um, letters to the editor that are, you know, going and saying things against the government. Uh, and it also protects employees that work for the government. So if you work for the government, um, you can't be overtly involved in a political campaign, but you can be involved um, and it be separated from your job. Free speech also protects where and when you can speak in public places. So you have the right to publicly express yourself um, free of censorship or punishment as long as it is in a public place. However, if things become outrageous or the commentary is unrefined or it becomes hate speech, you can um, be warned not to do anything, but you cannot be punished for it. Um, they just basically want to try to cause less harm. <clears throat> However, the government can ban protests from traditional public forums if they feel that there is a privacy, safety, or health interest that could be violated. Um, and they have also looked at um, blocking social media for those types of incidences. That's where um, Parler got blocked because they felt like it um, was part of the reason of the um, Capitol uh, riots. And then the government can control a non-public forum, uh, basically just that it's a neutral interest, right? So if you go somewhere that is non-public and try to like hold a protest, um, you don't have that right. So that's a little bit about the First Amendment and how it protects the press. But there's also this, this idea that's called um, libel and emotional distress. You might also hear about it as libel and slander. Uh, and so when we talk about the First Amendment and how it protects citizens, this is where this comes in. So if you don't know the difference between libel and slander, this is a way to remember it. Um, just, you know, super easy um, introduction. Spider-Man wasn't attacking the city. He was trying to save it. That's slander. It is not. I resent that. Slander is spoken and print. It's libel. You don't trust anybody. That's your problem. So, uh, remember, slander is spoken, S and S, libel is printed. So, um, when you talk about defamation and how it protects people, um, there is a difference. Slander is the action or the crime of making a false spoken statement that damages a person's reputation, and libel is published false statements that are damaging to a person's reputation. So <clears throat> we talked about what the First Amendment protects very briefly. There's lots of things that go into that. But one of the things that it does protect is the idea of talking about somebody or something. But you have to make sure that what you're saying is the truth or it can come back on you. And that's where this comes in. So uh, basically the elements of libel, um, libel serves as a check of power to the media, meaning they can't just say anything. They have to have some type of proof, but the proof is put on the plaintiff, which means that if I were to say something defamatory against Spider-Man, then I, as the media, do not have to show the proof for it. Spider-Man would have to come and say, here's the proof that what they said is libel. Um, or slander if they said it out loud and uh, to say that they have to have a statement of fact basically libelous if the statement is an assertion of a fact meaning that they can prove it that has to be imperative to different to differentiate between fact and opinion and that's why we try to always put that something is an opinion when we print it um, so that it doesn't get caught up in a libel case um, because opinion is not libelous. You can say those things as long as you say, this is my opinion. It's when you don't say it and you are stating it as fact and truth um, that you can get in trouble. 
So here's five rules um, of slander and libel to remember. If the statement in question is true, they won't be considered defamatory nearly all the time. Uh, so basically, if what you write about something or someone is true, then you don't have to worry. Um, opinion does not constitute defamation. In order for a statement to be libelous or slanderous, it must contain a false statement or fact. And the material must have been imparted to the people, meaning um, just because you've said it to your coworker does not make it slander or, you know, writing it on a piece of paper and passing the note. It has to be published to the public in some way. And finally, the plaintiffs must show that the statements under review led to some kind of harm or emotional damage. They can't just say, oh, they lied about this and it didn't do anything to me, so I want them punished. It has to, you have to show some kind of harm. Um, again, it has to be made public. Um, if a vendor republishes something um, that they see that is libelous um, to a new publication, the um, vendor itself will not be in trouble uh, because of the Communication Decency Act. And then unknown publishers and anon anonymous speech are not always protected. Uh, so basically, like, if I posted something on YouTube talking trash about Spider-Man um, and he came back and could prove that I was doing that, YouTube itself wouldn't get in trouble. I would. Um, when it comes to trying to unmask anonymous posters, um, the plaintiff or the person who is saying that this caused harm to them must present uh, the court with some kind of face evidence of saying this is what happened and this is who I think it could be. Uh, plaintiffs must also show a legitimate good faith basis to advance their case, meaning um, it has to show some kind of harm to their reputation. It has to um, have some kind of concern and a group identification necessary for a group uh, to be libeled, meaning that you have to, like the group has to be um, recognizable under what you called them. So, <clears throat> what can be considered libel or um, defamation? Well, um, if it's false and injurious to another, if it exposes another person to hatred, contempt, or ridicule, uh, it tends to harm the reputation of others and cause the loss of goodwill or confidence from others, meaning like you could lose your job, your family could turn it against you, people could try to cancel you, those kinds of things. Um, if you are involved in libel, it is considered criminal activity. It is unethical to um, do, basically, as a journalist or a media professional. It's also unprofessional and can be considered immoral. When it comes to defamation, it can be words or images um, that are subject to a person being scorned or ridiculed. Um, it can expose a person to hatred, contempt, or aversion, or be prejudiced in someone else's eyes um, to a respectable minority. We have what's called libel per quo, um, and this comes about when the matter by itself does not appear to be defamatory. Um, so it could be like a headline or illustration or a photograph, um, and so there is some gray area there. When it comes to proving falsity, um, the plaintiff, again, has to show a statement of falsity or show how it is not the truth. They also have to show substantial truth to back that up. And you can have libel by implication, uh, but it's a little harder to prove. They also have to have fault. Um, the defendant must mean say that we did not know um, this is where we got it or this is how we know it is a fact. And um, they have to be proven to show actual malice, like they were out to hurt somebody. Well, what is actual malice? Basically, it's the fact that somebody knew that the information they published was false, that they didn't really care for the truth. They just kind of disregarded it. Um, and that, you know, they they had a reason to hurt them in some way. So we have this idea of, you know, it harming them or causing emotional distress when it comes to libel and slander. 
And what is considered emotional stress? Well, you have serious mental anguish. You have the intentional infliction of emotional distress, um, the negligent infliction of emotional distress. It can be caused by reckless act or statement. Um, it has to be considered extreme and outrageous. It could um, cause severe emotional harm. Um, maybe the way that they gathered the information was outrageous, like they were going through your dumpster. Um, and it could be uh, that it was proven um, or put out on an entertainment program or a news report and was false, so like a tabloid. So that is a brief introduction of the First Amendment and how it protects different parts of speech and then how, as an individual, um, it can cause harm to you and how you can protect yourself from it. So again, the First Amendment is a vast thing to study. You, When you go to law school, you have an entire class just on this amendment. So this is a small section of it, but I wanted to um, just kind of go through some important things that you might have to think about as a journalist or media professional.